In his early movies, Vince Edwards always ended up in a fetal position, dead as a doornail. In three of those films, his death throes were photographed by Lucian Ballard. The Killing, Murder by Contract, and City of Fear. Equally adept at westerns, Ballard shot plenty of death scenes in his career, including the wonderfully austere western he made with Bud Bedeker in 1958, Buchanan Rides Alone. That may have been what led to Ballard's greatest work, shooting Sam Peckinpah's 1969 classic, The Wild Bunch, which culminated with the most violently spectacular gun battle in movie history. Director Irving Lerner had more than a passing interest in weapons of mass destruction. In 1944, working as a documentary filmmaker, he and colleague Ben Matto were arrested and accused of being communist spies for attempting to photograph the cyclotron in Lawrence Livermore Lab at the University of California, where Professor Robert Oppenheimer helped develop the atomic bomb. No charges were filed, however, and both Maddow and Lerner worked extensively in the movie business in the 1950s, often using fronts when producers were wary of their leftist bias. As for Cobalt 60, it is a real thing. Although the script plays fast and loose with its actual properties, as early as 1950, it was being tested by the government for exactly the use suggested here, when added to a megaton bomb, the dispersal of radioactivity would essentially wipe out all life in a vast area before dissipating after five years. Hey, they weren't just making this stuff up, folks. The co-writer of City of Fear, Robert Dillon, started his screenwriting career with this movie. After a few years writing stuff like X, The Man with the X-Ray Eyes for Roger Corman, and William Castle's The Old Dark House, Dylan wrote a few cult crime favorites in the 1970s, Prime Cut, 99 and 44 one-hundredths percent dead, and French Connection 2. His last script, to date, was for the excellent thriller Waking the Dead in 2000. I mentioned at the top that most of the crew of Murder by Contract also worked on City of Fear. Also returning was actress Kathy Brown, who played the shoe clerk. It's nowhere near the juicy role she had in Murder by Contract, but it allowed her to work with her husband at the time, Sherwood Price, who played the part of the twitchy junkie, Pete Hallen. She eventually divorced Price, and in 1969, she married another actor, Darren McGavin, whom she was with until her death in 2003. In a film made largely by a group of up-and-coming talents, the senior member of both cast and crew was the guy who played Police Chief Jensen, Lyle Talbot. A dashing leading man of the pre-code era, Talbot was one of the founders of the Screen Actors Guild, something far more historically significant than what he's most known for today, appearing with Bela Lugosi and Vampira in Ed Wood's Plan 9 from Outer Space, generally heralded as the worst movie ever made, or at least the most laughably inept. Lyle Talbot's greatest accomplishment, however, may be the family he produced with his wife, Margaret Eppel. Their offspring all have their own significant careers. Eldest son Stephen Talbot was a child actor turned esteemed documentary filmmaker. David Talbot is a renowned author of political histories and the founder of Salon.com. Cynthia Talbot is an eminent physician and Margaret Talbot is a longtime essayist for The New Yorker. She wrote a fantastic book about her father called The Entertainer. But the talent didn't stop there. Lyle's grandson, Joe Talbot, recently co-wrote and directed the critically acclaimed 2019 film The Last Black Man in San Francisco. As a bonus treat today on Noir Alley, we are presenting Joe Talbot's actual first film, a 10-minute short he made about the Noir City Film Festival I produce each year in San Francisco. Stay tuned. It's coming up right after I sign off. I am immensely proud to have given Lyle Talbot's grandson his first job as a filmmaker. As always, share your thoughts about today's movie on our social media pages and feeds, and then join me again next week when one of film noir's favorite bad girls, Audrey Totter, serves up what may be her most delicious slice of femme fatale cheesecake in the 1949 film, 
tension. Till then, see you in the shadows. What has happened at the Castro is it's actually kind of remarkable because when we started out, we really didn't know what was going to happen. I had no idea if people would respond to this. And then over the years, it has just grown to this phenomenal uh, festival. It re and it really is a festival. You have all these people. Some come dressed to the nines like it's 1944. Some are young filmmakers trying to learn their craft from the masters. And then there's the seasoned vets who come here to see the newly unearthed films. And they're all brought together in a sort of giant party to watch these movies. The audiences are so great. I mean, they react fantastic. You know, when the man grabs the woman by the arm, the crowd hisses. And the crowd roars when she shoots her man. It becomes more than just a showing of film. There's posters and books and booze in the mez and hot Betty Page girls walking around in the aisle and guest stars. The famous and the infamous can cross paths in the same place, and it's just, it's absolutely amazing. Oh boy, old punk rockers connected with noir. Where did it start? Well, the movies were cool, obviously, and some of them had a certain sleaze and degenerate vibe to them that appealed. <laughs> Boy, what is film noir? I've been asked that question a million times. It's a million dollar question, because uh, I don't know what noir is, and that's why I keep searching for it, and I've been doing it for decades now. Well, I think it's very interesting that that question, what is film noir, is still really controversial or complicated, because I think a lot of people feel like they know it when they see it. <laughs> stylized crime. Bad people doing bad things and uh, Great. love to watch them Camera do it. angles. And this quality of, of the lighting. If they are doomed by their own obsessions. A beautiful woman. An evil woman. Beautiful costumes. That's noir to me. 
You don't seem to get the idea at all. You're gonna fry for this. Some people think that film noir is a genre, but I don't like to think of it that way because I don't see it being defined by the kind of tropes and, and cliches that people are really familiar with. On the one hand, you have this American dream that everybody is trying to follow. And on the other hand, there's this urge to destroy this fantasy and to, to uncover it as, as fake. So in noir, you have, I guess, both of these worlds. You see that this America is really not uh, an ideal world and it's full of corruption and full of darkness and a little bit of light. That to me is the most important thing. Certain themes of alienation, anxiety, moral ambiguity, disillusionment, it's that element of delving into the psychology, into the why of these stories. Film Noir exposited one great theme. You're fucked. These films still address very real issues of today, but they do offer much more glamour, much more style, they're much sexier. <laughs> What I really like about noir is that it's not just, you know, just peachy, life is great, whatever. It shows, you know, real elements of darkness, murder, drama, prostitution, all kinds of, you know, things that make it so much more exciting than just regular old films. Women have a real sense of self-preservation, I think, in, in this. And it's something that we move away from so strongly um, in the 50s films with Marilyn Monroe, with the, the ditzy, please help me, all I need is a man. You'll never have another Barbara Stanwyck. You'll never have another Gloria Graham. I don't think there's really any other art form like film that has this problem of, of the art form itself being so fragile and so endangered. And I don't think that anyone who loves film feels there's any question that we have to find and save as many films as we can. Well, the preservation part of what we do is, is really important to me because I just can't believe that a culture can create something so great and then have it be considered kind of disposable. We're losing and have lost some of the great works that have been made in this in this medium. As far as I know, Noir City is the only film festival in America I know of that uses the receipts from the box office to directly fund the restoration and preservation of film. And I think what the Film Noir Foundation does is especially valuable because they are really saving film itself and saving the experience of seeing film projected in theaters. And the best thing is, you know, you walk out of the, the cinema straight afterwards and you can talk to people about these things. You know, that's one of the best parts about it. You can talk to people before the films start, between the films, afterwards, you know, even on the streetcar going back downtown. You walk down the aisles here and uh, the only time that you see a cell phone is, is when someone's using it to light their program. That era in mid-20th century is eternally appealing to people. I guess we're preserving more than just the films themselves. We're preserving this whole iconic look and, and feel.